in a village in the heart of England, we're tracing the tale of one community through the whole of our history. Got something which is possibly prehistoric. Yeah? Oh, we've lost it. Oh, no, no, don't, don't, say don't, that. don't say that. The village is Kibworth in Leicestershire. When we get into the post normal period, look how it changes. Huge wow. explosion of growth. With science, history, and archaeology, we're seeing how the story of the village is also the story of the nation. This area of South Leicestershire is very radicalised politically. You're fighting for England, he says. They were killed in the abbey. The high altar itself was splashed with blood. To help us, we've got wonderful village archives. I think this is what you've really come to see. From the 13th century, we can tell the stories of individual peasant families over the generations. Suddenly, with this, the village and its people come to life. In the documents, everyday tales of medieval lives. Emma Gilbert, Villain. Robert, the doctor. Alice Starr. Matilda Starr. Sisters. So how will the villagers cope with the horrors that lie ahead in the 14th century, the most catastrophic in our history? That's the next chapter of the story. stage of our search, I've come to ask the help of the children at Kibworth High School. Imagine that is the A6. Yeah? Now the A6 is an ancient road, but it takes a modern little turn through Kibworth Harcourt, and the original village street goes something like this, yeah? And this is I'm asking the children to dig archaeological test pits to find out more about the village in the early 14th century. We're going to put our pits in the memorial garden and along there. We've already dug 55 pits across the village, but we need to know more. So first of all, we're going to take out all the plants from that. So many of these will, go, many of these will have quite deep. So now we've targeted the area behind the medieval marketplace and in the gardens behind two of the old farmhouses. Like England as a whole, the village had a boom time up to 1300. Hey! In 1300, Kibworth Parish consisted of the hamlet of Smeaton Westerby and the two main manors of Kibworth Beecham and Kibworth Harcourt. Maybe a thousand people in all, free men and women, serfs and villains. But the length of them is very impressive, isn't it? I mean, yeah. there's, there's quite a lot of land in, in, in that back yeah. area there, which is obviously agricultural. Yes. And, and maybe one housing plot here, possibly, or, mm. or two. What do you make of the house, first of all? Any instant impressions there? The way you analyse a building like this is to count the bays, that is, the distance between the upright timbers. So you've got one, two, three, four bays. Mm -hmm. And each bay is roughly 15 feet long. So mm. by sort of 1600, it's a jolly nice farmer's house. But mm. back in the 1300, yes. um, maybe more than one family of villains. What, what, what would a villain have had on this? Plot. Well, villains are not very privileged people. They are, they're unfree, so they, 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 they have to go to the Lord's Court, and it's the Lord's Court which rules over their lives. Um, and in Kibworth Harcourt, uh, they had 12, 12 acres of land each, a holding of 12 acres of land. Pass, Beyond yeah. the village boundary, okay. in the open field. Both the Kibworths and Smeaton were open field villages. 
Each of the great fields was divided into many small strips, which were shared out and farmed communally by the peasants and their families. To keep the fields fertile, the peasants carted out all the manure from their barns and yards, with whatever debris was mixed up in it. So today we're searching for medieval rubbish. Most of it gets here because they have a midden, they have a muck heap in the yard behind the house. They put every bit of rubbish onto it and it all gets shoveled onto a cart called a tumbrel. And then when you get into the field, you pull a lever and the, and the stuff gets dumped onto, the, onto yeah, the field. And you're spreading, along with half a tonne of manure, you're spreading pieces of uh, broken pottery. Which then... we go to so much trouble picking up <laughs> again. <laughs> It was back-breaking work, but it was the way of life for our ancestors, men and women, for 800 years. Wow. When you plot this stuff, you can see the, the scatters of Stamford Ware from the, you know, the late Saxon period, when these field systems are first laid out. You can see the early medieval, the late medieval, and, and quite often the, you know, the, the early post-med, the late post-med, depending on when it's enclosed. What would you have seen standing here in 1300? 100% cultivation, really. A very boring landscape, really, because it's, you know, it's, all, it's all brown in the autumn, it's all yellow in the, uh, in, in the summer, you know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's very, very heavily cultivated. How does Nicholas Poley mm. know that his strip mm. is different mm. from Walter Peaks and from the, mm. from the, well, at the, the, end the of Russells and the... At the end <laughs> of the strip, imagining this hedge, which of course wasn't there then, <laughs> as a headland at the end of the strip, you would have some sort of marker and it could be a, a wooden post, it could be a stone. Later on, the stone might even have an initial on it, you mm. know, P for Pooley or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, I've recently discovered that in Yorkshire, they had holes. They were so mean in Yorkshire <laughs> that they just they didn't have a post or a stone, they just <laughs> dug a little <laughs> hole. And that marks the, the, the boundary. And this way of life, hand ploughing with animals, continued all over England well into the 20th century. The open field system was not only labour intensive, it took a huge amount of mental effort to memorise all the intimate detail of the fields and strips. Most of that knowledge is lost now, but not at Kibworth. Because back in 1300, the farmers of Kibworth Harcourt gave every detail of their land and lives to the new landlords, Merton College, Oxford. The field itself is, is East Field, I and mean, it gives us in, in English Est Field. This is strip by strip with the furlongs being, and, named, being described. And the local jury writing this down as they see it. I've got the later names of the field strips here in the East Field. The Long Coombs Furlong, the Blackland Furlong, Stone Hill Furlong. Yes, we have Stone Hill here. Stone Hull, two Celians, so two strips on the two stone, strips on the on two strips. And of course, a perfect name, it would, it would remind you, it's the stony bit of land at the top of the field. Long Ho and Short Ho and Hearn Seek Furlong. Berridge Home Furlong. Slee, and Slade, Slade Wong. Slade Wong. Names and customs. The pattern of the landscape in the minds of the people. Handed down for a thousand years. Broad Wong. Broader Wong. <laughs> down here. Five strips. That is just so fantastic. Now, these strips of parchment have ex parte umbrae and ex parte solis on the shady side and on the sunny side. That's the way the jury remember the strips. Yeah. By memorizing the fields as the sun goes, goes round, round like so that. So it is orientation as you so go it's, round it's So it's you... orientation. Horse, Langelon, yeah. Yeah, Horse Hill. That top part is 
appears to be. This research being done on, on camera is <laughs> the real thing now. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's faking this. But... <laughs> In an agricultural community like medieval Kibworth, the most important man was the plowman, and the most important animals were the oxen. Come on, Bryce, walk. They bred them, cared for them, lived with them. Walk on. And in Weald and Downland Open Air Museum, they're doing a fascinating piece of experimental archaeology, training young oxen ready to take the plow. For the small pool family, couldn't have what you term as an oxen, uh, a male, castrated male, standing around all year doing nothing. So they work the cows, the females. You can have a calf and you can milk it. So it's a multi-purpose multi, multi -purpose animal. And if you only had one cow, your neighbor had a cow, you'd put the two together. If you had a, another neighbor had a pony, then you can put the pony on the front and have a three team. So they used everything they could Come on. G back. So do they they know when they're being talked to, do they individually? They do, yes. <laughs> yeah, they've uh, each pair has the same letter. So these two are Rose and Ruby. Yeah. And the ones behind us are Gwen and Graceful. Um, it's a single syllable name near side, this side, and double syllable off side. I mean the most we know recorded, put together, was 86. 86? 86, no. yeah. yeah. And that was to um, move a windmill. They moved a windmill from the centre of Brighton, I think it was Regency Square, oh. and they moved it up onto the South Downs. In the Middle Ages, the ploughmen are quite charismatic figures, you know, famous ploughmen in their patchwork coats, and the fictional Piers ploughman becomes a kind of English everyman subject of a tide of popular song and social protest poetry through the 14th century because well, as the ballad makers said on his shoulders rested the mirth of all the land and god speed well the plough was not just a proverb it was a heartfelt prayer let me get on with it thank you <laughs> rose come on walk on rose Rose, come on. Now, if you were a free man or woman, you ploughed your own fields, paid rent, and sold your surplus after tax. But if you were an unfree peasant, a villain, a cotter, or a serf, you also owed your lord service. And that could be a real burden. Whoa. Survey of the Manor of Kibworth. It's dues and services yes, and, and customs. And customs. So this is Merton mm -hmm. recording the community pretty much pretty soon after they've got a hold of it. Th that's right. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the college wants to know, um, you know, what what its dues are, and, you know, what comes to it, and, and what its to some extent what its, its liabilities are, I suppose, to yeah. to the tenants. And here the dues. Are they, this is what peasants owed here. And not just in in money, but in in services. Two days ploughing each year without food, bringing your own <laughs> plough. Gathering straw together for roofing the buildings of the manor court whenever needed. Carrying the Lord's corn to Leicester Market on your own horse, but no further. Unless it be within the county. Walk on. Carrying coal within the county, using your own cart. Two days mowing the Lord's Meadow with one man. Two days harrowing and hoeing with food provided. Reaping four days. The men of the village to mow the Lord's Meadow with a gift of one shilling and sixpence in beer. And on 1300 prices, that was enough to get you very drunk. So from the 1270s, the Merton Archive gives us the most incredible detail on Kibworth Harcourt. We can trace everybody in the village from then until now virtually and do family trees of peasants for 15 generations. But what about Kibworth Beecham and Smeaton and Westerby? Well, the missing gap is here in the parish 
and county history of Leicestershire of the antiquarian William Burton. It's one of the earliest of the county histories and it contains our first historical accounts of the Kibworths and Smeaton. Published in 1622, the same year, the same publisher and the same printer as uh, Shakespeare's folio. Of course, it's obsessed, as you'd expect, with manorial history. But what's really interesting about this is that Burton's notes survive. And they're uh, an altogether different matter. Here they are. Um, they were written down in 1615. Copied from the ancient original membranes by me, W. Burton. 15th of July, 1615. He excerpted the great rolls of the survey of 1279, the most detailed survey of Eng England ever done before modern times. They're lost now, but here, largely unpublished in his notebooks, are the first detailed accounts, not only of uh, Kibworth Harcourt, but Kibworth Beecham and Smeaton Westerby. Starting with Smeaton, here for the first time are the names of families in the village, and some of them very long-lasting families in the village story. Uh, the Allens and the Astins, very long-lasting names in that part of Leicestershire and indeed in Kibworth. Um, when you turn to Beecham, though, nearly everybody unfree. There's about 45 families of villains and serfs. 1315. And it had two mills, one water and one wind. Oh, did yes, it? Yes, how about that? Well. But attached to it, 200 acres of land. So that must have been... Yes, that piece down there, straight yeah. down, yeah. yes. All the way across yes. to... To Smeaton. To Smeaton. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's always called the old house in the middle of the village. And you had, you had, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> saying, you had a communal bread oven out in the, in the, the village street. So, again, the villagers brought their corn to make bread. A, a little cut of that went to the manor house. Four free tenants, 24 villains, each one with a cottage and 15 acres, and 18 serfs who were the, the lowest level kind of peasantry. Wow. So the Beecham half of Kibworth was still unfree as it had been back in 1066. That's how things stood in Kibworth at the height of the feudal system. The population of the parish at well over a thousand, now as high as it will get until Victorian times. This is context two, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and this so. is the out of our, out of our pit. pit. Yeah. On Main Street, the kids have not yet got down to the level of the medieval marketplace. The long bones and the ribs, and, yeah, different things. We love you, But for the field walkers, there were easy pickings from the once teeming medieval fields. There's certainly stuff from the, the 13th, 14th century. And in Cambridge, Carenza Lewis is collating the evidence from our earlier test pits showing the growth of the village up to the boom time before 1300. Two areas of settlement. Here, the villages that we can see today seem to be taking off. This is the point where we can see the villages we know today starting to have their, their direct origins. Smeaton West again, that the longest occupied village is clearly continuing to prosper. The other really significant place we've got is up here in Kibworth Harcourt. You can actually see the village growing. I mean, yeah. that is Kibworth Harcourt extending along the street there. Pottery coming out of virtually every test pit yes, there. Yes, yeah. And not much in Kibworth Beecham. You know, there's an old um, uh, village legend that, that kind of Harcourt is the kind of posh, rather well-to-do end, and Beecham's always the poor end. But you wouldn't ever find that hinted at in the... The pottery, would you, well, Carenza? Is that that's what's so fascinating? Fantasy, well, that's what's so fascinating about this period is you've got these two strands of evidence that we can use to sort of yeah. reflect off each other, really. Yeah. And I mean, it is interesting, isn't it, that in the light of that knowledge, you can look at this map and think, well, there's very much yeah. less here. It's funny, isn't it, how history can leave its mark? In Victorian times, the villagers even argued about separate sewage systems. Harcourt and Beecham had different doors in the church and even separate parts of the graveyard. This is the surviving windmill at Kibworth Harcourt. They had two here and two over in Kibworth Beecham. It's a
post mill. You turned it on its central post using this wooden tail to face the wind. This was new technology that had spread over England in the 13th century to feed the booming population. There's more than 1,500 people. But here in Kibworth, as across England, the boom time was over. There were too many mouths to feed, not enough jobs, too many poor people desperately struggling to survive on marginal land. And around 1300, you get the first signs of recession, price rises, social unrest, and even disturbing patterns in the weather. But even in their worst imaginings, they couldn't have foreseen what lay ahead. From the 1290s, the English summer went wrong. And in a credulous age, omens and prophecies started to stack up. 1302. It is foretold that great misfortunes lie ahead. Earthquakes and wars. Division of realms and peoples. And a great and unheard of famine. As climate change set in, the village braced itself. <laughs> the key person at village level was the reeve. The reeve's job was to supervise the agricultural year in the village. The ploughing and the reaping and the sowing. He chaired the village court, adjudicated on disputes, and he submitted the accounts to the landlords, the fellows of Merton College. And the Reeve in 1314 was a man called John Poley. He was married with four kids, Agnes, Hugh, Will and Rob. He wasn't a rich man, his father only held seven and a half acres, but he was a free man, not a villain. And it's in John's accounts that the first signs can be seen of the coming catastrophe. In the Kibworth court rolls, and in many others across England, we can watch as disaster strikes. 1314, January. There was severe cold. One frost lasted more than two weeks. Extra milk was needed for the lambs and oats for the horses. Spring, April very cold. A high mortality of doves. Summer was cold with continual rain. The roses were late this year. Autumn, very wet, followed by a sharp frost. Ploughing was late, more oats were needed for the horses. Winter, snow cover for much of the time. We fed the peas to the pigs. 1315, a late winter this year. It was wet and cold into the spring. Extra hoeing. The peas were flooded. Summer was very wet, very low yields for barley and wheat. Autumn, very wet, ploughing prolonged, sheep rot. 1316, late spring, the weather was wet, more sheep rot. Summer was exceptionally dry, ground rock hard. We had to purchase 12 measures of steel and 40 pieces of iron for the repair of ploughs. Much more this year because of the dryness of the summer and the hardness of the fallow. By 1315, the people found themselves in the worst famine in British and European history. The harvest of 1315 was a disaster. Poor tenants were forced to give up their holdings and sell off their gear. People were dying everywhere. Grain yields slumped and prices shot up. While rich merchants bought up the surplus to make a profit, the peasants were thrown back on their knowledge of the countryside. Your main meal would have been your pottage, your porree, whatever happened to be in season, even edible weeds, things like 
fat hen, an orange, and a bitter cress. We know about the medieval cottage garden from a minute excavation done of one peasant house, the kind lived in by Matilda and Alice Starr. Plot of vegetables and herbs would be just go right up to your cottage front. Then. Absolutely, you would cultivate as much as you possibly could. Really, yeah. starvation was always uh, a possibility, mm -hmm. and you would grow whatever you possibly could. And this is where your edible weeds came in: mm -hmm. mallows, hyssop, mugwort, the Artemisia of vulgaris, the wild wormwood. If your crops failed, at least you'd have something to put in the Pottage. If you were good at doing this, you, you could just good, about keep things you together. You may well be able to keep going. You learn what's around in your local area. So you know what's growing in your hedgerows and you know from past experience what's good to pick and what isn't. Yeah, yeah. You've got beer in there and of course you get lots of calories from that. You've got all these greens herbs from the hedgerows, got things like alexanders and fivers, flat leaf parsley, um, and depending what year we're in, we'll get changes of those as well. So they really knew how to uh, exploit what was around them then? I think yeah. so, I yeah. think so, yeah. 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 So, um, and it's very much a community effort as well, it's not just the family, it's everybody living in that rural area, you know, with field strips, farming those strips their animals. People are still living with their animals too because they're that precious, you know, you've got to make sure they're going to get through the winter. The next year, 1316, things only got worse. Across England, hundreds of thousands were now dying. Northern Europe froze under a blanket of snow and ice. What they didn't know was that they were in the middle of a little ice age. And then came a new and disturbing development, the first signs of a virulent pestilence among animals, recorded by the Leicester chronicler Henry Knighton. In 1318 and 1319, there was an horrific mortality of humans and a pestilence of animals throughout the Kingdom of England. Conditions were so bad that the surviving people didn't have the wherewithal to cultivate or sow their lands. Every day they were burying as many as they could in improvised cemeteries everywhere. And so a great ruin seized the English people. There's a tiny detail from that time at the manor house in Kibworth Beecham, where the absentee landlord had let things fall to rack and ruin. The jury say that the manor house itself is a total ruin and has been divided up into cottages worth five shillings a year, it says. They note all these things, don't they, in the Middle Ages, yeah. and let out to farm. So it's a little kind of snapshot, isn't yes. it? But that terrible yeah. winter coming on when, oh. when they lost all their harvest yes. with the rain in the, that autumn. We've nearly, had a, we've nearly had a winter like that up here now. Yes. It's been a horrible winter. Yeah with the world, terrible lot of rain. You imagine what that must have been like yes. in a community yes, where, quite. well, everybody in yes. the village devoted their labor yes. to making food, wasn't it? Absolutely. Grain prices in Leicester Market during the famine had now shot up seven times to 44 shillings a quarter when you needed eight quarters to sow an acre. As the famine got worse, the Merton court books are full of little details. In the winter of 1314 to 15, Nick Sybil died, and the college took over the administration of his strips as his son was underage. And then, 1315 to 16, the court book says, John Sybil, aged 14, inherited his father's lands, and he sowed them with seven pence worth of oats, 18 pence worth of wheat, and four shillings worth of peas. He was the breadwinner now. So with a widowed mother and younger siblings, young John was in trouble. Harvest 1316 was another disaster, and to make things worse, there were signs of sickness in his most precious possession, his plough oxen. 
Almost four million animals have been killed since the... Like the modern foot and mouth epidemic in Britain, the virus raged out of control. Only this, more virulent and more agonizing. There was also an unheard of mortality among the cattle, the oxen, the cows and the calves. It continued unabated for several years and everywhere the poor cattle seemed to be crying out to the people, looking at them and roaring as if they were in tears because of the terrible pain that gnawed at their insides. And then suddenly they would fall down and die. The news of such terrible suffering in the countryside caused great consternation here in Merton. They saw immediately that it would be impossible to push the receipt of rents as it had been before the famine. The Great Famine was remembered with bitterness. The merchants still had profited. The supplies had been there, which had a supine government been motivated to move them with more alacrity, could perhaps have staved off disaster. As the popular songs of the time said, there was one law for the rich and one for the poor, for might is right and the land is lawless. More than half a million people in England died in the Great Famine, 10% of the population. But peasant societies like medieval Kibworth are resilient. For centuries, they lived with famine and disease. And in the 1320s, they began to recover. So much so that in 1327, the king raised a poll tax on all freeholders. And in the National Archive, the returns survive for Kibworth. But what do they call it in 1327, David? Just K-Y-B-B-E-W-O-R-T-H, Kibworth. This is for the 20th of 1327, so it's a 20th of the value of everybody's chattels, which is basically your corn and your animals. You had to have corn and, and, and animals worth 10 shillings, which is, in modern terms, half a pound. The minimum you'd actually pay for the tax, if you had 10 shillings, mm. would be sixpence. So that's six of these, where, where oh, are my yeah, pennies? Let's have a look. Cool. Here is, wait for it, medieval money. Let's pour it all oh, out. Oh, great. And these are all, these are silver pennies from the yeah. mid-13th century. Yeah. And this is the only currency. So everything had to be paid in silver pennies. Anything which is just pence, 18 pence, 18 pence, 14 pence, 12 pence, um, you're a peasant and you're... Whereas, I mean, the top person, William Swan, has got four and six, that's 54 pennies, as against 12 pennies here. And he would be a sort of ma a major sort of freeholder. So there are big class saying. divisions and wealth divisions within Within Kibworth, then? You, there are yeah. Big, yeah, clearly here, even within what is a peasant society, there are big class divisions. I mean, the really poor people aren't there. So we don't know what the size of Kibworth was. There might have been, mm. if you had a whole list of the names of villagers, it might go on for ages, yeah, yeah, with yeah. people yeah. below the line yeah. needed for taxation. During this time, Leicester, nearby, began to draw many Kibworth people as craftsmen, drapers, ironmongers, joining guilds, bettering themselves. Leicester was growing. Uh, and of course it was growing because people were coming in because they could make a better living. But this is actually a tax roll. People who are identified by their trade or where they come from. You've got William of Kibworth, Geoffrey of Osbaston, or William of Lutterworth. Mm. They're local places, but also people from further afield. There's, mm. there's someone from Carlisle, I think I noticed earlier. Mm. But they're not all men either. There's Alicia de Kibworth here. These are people who are living in Leicester, Yes. Um, who are taxed in Leicester. Yes. Could even be guild members in Leicester, perhaps. Yes. But keeping their village name 
but working in trades here? I, I suppose that's how they know, you know. Um, I'm talking about William. Which William? Well, the William from Kibworth, that William. There's a, only a limited number of Christian names, so you're beginning to see surnames coming in, aren't we? But cities can be dangerous places, especially for inexperienced country boys. From the time of the famine, there's a cautionary tale involving a man from Kibworth. Contensio motar erat. Yes, yeah. yes. Punch-up. A punch-up? This is a fight between Ivo, cleric of Great Stretton, yeah. and Henry Pollings, who's described as... Groom of the... Alice of Stretton. That's right. Yeah. But she's Alice of Stretton of, of Leicester. Leicester. She's one of the newcomers who come to the city that's right. but keep the name of their village as well as that's the... That's right, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So a dispute broke out between Ivo the Clark, so he's a, he's a let lettered person, yes. this guy, yes. and Henry Pollings, Alice Stretton's groom, in a place called Parchman Lane. Parchman Lane, yes. It was a, a little sort of lane that ran just inside the town walls. In November, of around the hour of Vespers, Sort of yeah. four, six yeah, o'clock yes. evening, anyway, yes. it would be dusk. Yeah, 25th of November. Yes, it'd darkness be dark. coming on. Yes. Narrow yes. lane. Yes, just the place to have your <laughs> rumpus, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they were doing. Now enters the Good Samaritan, Philip Le Young of Kibworth, son of one of Merton's free tenants. And he's about to pay a heavy price for being a have a go hero. It's almost like a citizen's arrest, isn't it? Yeah. Gets hold of this chap and and takes him towards the, the house of the aforesaid Alice. Then, vain it quia Johannes filius Alani, le mustard maker. John, the son of Alan, Alan the mustard maker. The notorious, I hope, <laughs> mustard makers. Yes, that's right, yes. Great. Yes. Great. Out he comes. Yes. All roads lead to Alice's house. Yes. With a certain bow and shot the aforesaid Philip with a certain small arrow in the head between the eye and the nose, right, right up to the brain. Very unpleasant. Yes. Philip lived until the following Monday and and then he died. The coroner's language is, is, is almost like today, isn't it? The aforesaid John did the aforesaid in a <laughs> westerly right. direction. A sword worth five shillings. That's yeah, right. That absolutely That's great. It. That's it. And before the bailiff, the, the inquiry was held, yes. which said that no one was suspected except the aforesaid John, yes. Yes. who had fled the scene who after the, the deed. Scene. That's right, that's right. And, and got away, presumably. Yeah. And, and John, the son of Alan the mustard maker, sounds a slightly nefarious character, do you think, Robin? Well, I, 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 he's, a, he's a wanted man now. Yes, he's yeah. a fugitive and outlaw. As for Philip's family, they must have wished he'd stayed on the family strips in the East Field, or that he'd come home early for Christmas. Now, in the 14th century, Christmas was the great holiday. You got three weeks off from work in the fields from mid-December to Plough Monday, after Twelfth Night. That was the time when the ploughmen and their boys carried the ploughshare around the houses of the village with songs and dancing and received cakes and ale. It's a tradition that survived till the 1930s in Kibworth. It was a festive time for medieval villagers, when work was put aside and neighbours got together. <laughs> but at Christmas 1348, terrible rumours came down the road from London. Nearby in Leicester, Henry Knighton tells the tale. It started in India, and then it moved across the face of the earth from Tartary through the land of the Saracens and into the lands of the Christians, a universal plague upon mankind. 
and on the 25th of June, 1348, it landed at Weymouth. Rats came from the ships, from, and they came from Weymouth and spread the way north. And what caused it in particular? What was it about the rats? Andrew? The fleas on the rats had like a disease that was contagious. That, that's very good. How did it begin? Oil can be around. That's very good. Yeah. It's the bubonic plague that we're particularly looking at, and, and the pneumonic plague as well. Ever since, the Black Death has seized the European imagination, the ultimate symbol of the powerlessness of humanity in the face of King Death. In the winter of 1348, the plague reached London. Just outside London Wall, close to the Barbican, tradition says that a huge death pit was opened here, under Charterhouse Square. Under the grass are said to be 10,000 burials. Recently in London, the first Black Death Cemetery to be scientifically excavated has revealed close-up detail from 1348. The grave diggers, too scared to take coins from the purses of the dead. In Kibworth, they knew it was coming. A two-pronged attack up the Bristol Channel and through the rivers of East Anglia like malevolent monsters, and at the point of their jaws, Kibworth. That Christmas, young Robert Church had gone down to Oxford to apply in person to the fellows of Merton for a holding in the village. Perhaps he brought the plague back. The first known death in the parish was in Kibworth Beecham early that spring. And then, in the Merton Court Rolls, the full horror begins to unfold. Right, should be a fairly, fairly striking. Yeah. Written on both sides as well. Oh yeah. Twenty-two, thirteen forty-eight. So the college, even in the catastrophe of the Black Death, they tried to keep the administration Again, running and... Uh, um, the, the rhythm of life just con continues and, and it's a way of coping, I suppose. It's an incredibly human response in catastrophe, isn't it? To keep things to ordered, over, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Right, I think we have, yes, we have, we have it. Post-conquest in 23. 23rd year of the reign of... King Edward. Edward the Third. Edward the Third. Yeah. So 1349. Yeah. The year of the Black the death. death. And we know what time of year this was, do we? Uh, should even give us a a day. Fourteenth yeah. uh, of May. Cool. These are the swearing in of new officers yes. and a yes. beadle. Um, the new reeve. Yes, names that we we recognise: Paul, William Paul. John Haynes. Haynes, yeah. Administration was so immediate. It wasn't a bureaucracy that was, you know, delegated to a, a local authority as we have today. <laughs> you were the local authority. It, 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 if you weren't elected this year, you could be elected next yeah, year yeah. to be the constable or the, you yeah. know, looking after the pound or the or whatever. Meeting of the village court, Kibworth Harcourt, St George's Day, 1349. John Church Reeve, the 
following tenants died of the pestilence. Emma Cook, Alice Aaron, John Church Sr., Agnes Poley, Robert Poley, Mr. Haynes, Mr. Goodwin, John and Constance Sybil. Margaret Meister, Richard Sylvester, Nick Clark, Henry Harcourt and Matilda Harcourt, Will Smith, Alice Carter, Adam Kibworth, Thomas Harcourt, Rob Meister, Nick Poley, Emma Wade, Agnes Allett, John Hayne, Will Milner. And 1349 wasn't the end of it. King Death came again to the village in 1361, in 1375, 78, 89 and 95 and a last cruel spasm in 1412. The Poli family alone had seven male members dead. Modern equivalent is like the First World War with, with a whole generation signing up and going off together and not coming back. What have we got here? So the black ink is, is replacements. Yes, yeah. and the browner writing has been crossed out and then sort of almost carroted in yeah. is, a, is, 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 wow. is, the new, is the new tenant. Gosh, is that, an, is that a poly up there as well? Can you, can you see? Yeah. In his notes in the court book, the Reeve keeps up the impression of normality. One of the customary tenants is, is one of the women. Yes, this is uh, mm. is Isabella Polly. Oh yes, has died. You can see her name has been crossed through, and mm. somebody completely different. In fact, I think it's a, a Robert, Robert Smith. Roberta Smith has been so. Not just it's not a member of her family unless by marriage, but it's a completely you know it's yeah, an, yeah. an alien. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's not passed from mother to son. Yeah, yeah, and the family couldn't take it over presumably mm. because of their losses. Yeah, possibly weren't enough yeah. sons to take over. Yeah. But you dug out this sort of space here, it's about this area, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you can still see bones coming through there. There's lots of tiny, tiny little bones there. And I found a few tiny bits of pottery popping out as well. Across Kibworth, exactly. many properties were abandoned at this time. But the evidence around the medieval marketplace for what happened after the Black Death was thin, to say the least. I think it's plastic. That's a, not, that's a big a bit disappointing yeah. in terms of medieval activity. Yeah. But I think having the sort of uh, negative evidence for the medieval period is good in itself as well. When you take this forward to the next period, wow. Smeaton, which has been with us for so long, yeah. um, seems to be absolutely devastated by it. There's just two or three sites um, that produce single shards of pottery. That is so amazing. The one area that carries on in, yeah. in occupation seems to be up here. Okay. And even if some of these other areas are occupied, what, what it's really showing is this huge dislocation where these are test pits that were producing pottery for the high medieval period, those plots are not being occupied nearly as intensively. The people who live there clearly are somewhere else. And you're talking, I suppose, about you know a population that's gone from maybe 2 million in 1086 to something like 6, possibly, in 1300. I mean, there's a lot of argument about mm. this, isn't it? But um, a collapse... Pro perhaps collapses collapse, back down to 2 or 3. Massive contraction. After the ravages of the plague, many English villages were deserted forever. But not here. Even Smeaton survived with the old families we met in the 1270s. The Allens, the Swans. But in Harcourt, the Merton Court rolls show the loss of two-thirds of the tenants. The highest losses from the Black Death known anywhere in Britain. And a hint of the villagers' reactions to the catastrophe comes in a box of documents which has recently turned up, recording grants made of property and land in the 1350s that later came into the hands of the village grammar school. They still provide a charitable income for Kibworth High School. It's an astonishing treasure trove, the school box. These are the earliest documents from the 1350s, the immediate aftermath of the Black Death. It's very rare that you can home in on what the ordinary people, the peasant farmers, 
are, are thinking at this time. But um, it's revealed here. This is a little land document, like a mortgage. Sciant presentes et futuri. No people now and people in the future. That I, John Deere, dedia concessi uh, this grant of land, um, confirmed with Robert Chapman of Kibworth. And it's the gift of one house, una messuagium, uh, which belonged to Nick Poli in Church Lane. Poli died in the Black Death, recently dead. Uh, along with a rood, that's a quarter of an acre in middle furlong, and a rood of meadow. What these men are doing is they're putting together a little parcel of property and land whose revenues, supervised by a group of local trustees, farmers, will give enough money to fund a chantry priest separate from the parish church. Now this priest may in time have even taught the kids in the village how to read and write, but his chief job is to do masses, dirges and requiems forever for the souls of the dead, for the mothers and fathers, the brothers and sisters and the children of the village who died in the Black Death, the greatest catastrophe in its history. That document from 1353 is the start of a whole series of gifts for commemoration and charity. In Kibworth, it's a continuous thread from the bequests of Tudor farmers in their wills to Victorian villagers who left trusts to provide for the poor. Our English ancestors believed that if a community is to thrive, it cannot leave the sick and the starving behind. In fact, they saw charity as one of the foundations of community. And you can still see it in action. This is Kibworth's 24-hour relay to raise money for cancer research. Of course, there's a huge gap between the 14th century and us. Sometimes it's hard to believe that we're the same people or that our medieval ancestors would recognize us as their descendants. But I think they still would. It's the, the spirit of Britain, partly crazy, very kind, very generous, very giving. It's been really good. A good friend of ours, Gordon. We kind of did it for him and for uh, everybody else that was in need, I suppose. So perhaps the values of the medieval world are not so far from us as we might think. They're still there, running just under the surface of our lives, keeping the connection with the generations of the past far and near. Everyone who enters the teams are given one of these bags and a candle. They decorate the candles and make a dedication to people who have either lost the fight, or are still in the fight, or they just love <laughs> Nepali, or have survived. There are lots of survivors too. And we say no be a mirror in darkness. No we know of party, but then he shall know, as I am knowing. And no dwell in faith, hope and charity but the most of these is charity. But catastrophe also changes us. After the Black Death, deep social unrest led in 1381 to mass revolt by peasants across England. But not in Kibworth. The later outbreaks of plague had brought village society almost to its knees. The early 15th century was one of the worst times in village history. But change was in the air. 
and driven by the community itself. In the face of such economic hardship and distress, many people at the time saw that change must come in the relationship between the rulers and the ruled in England. But the change came in Kibworth not through violent revolution, but through negotiation. And in 1427, the college took the key step of abolishing all 18 customary tenancies. That's the land holdings which were held by villains, semi-free peasants who owed work services to their lord. So from that moment, if you were an ordinary Kibworthian, you no longer held your land in bondagio, in bondage, but ad voluntatem, at will, in other words, negotiated with your landlord for a cash rent. And at the same time, the college reduced the rents right across the board. And then, finally, in 1439, a special court was held in Kibworth to cement this relationship. Kibworth, curia recognationis, between the customary tenants of Kibworth and the scholars of Merton College, Oxford. It's a document to finalise and record the mutual consent of both parties to the New Deal. It draws the line under the feudal age which has ruled in England since 1066 and even before. Now, labour services and villainage are abolished. You can have your son or daughter inherit your land. You can take out a leasehold. You can transfer lands, build up your holdings, amalgamate your tenancies. You can decide whether you want to be an arable farmer or whether you want to breed stock. You can view English history at this time through the lives of kings or queens, if you like, through the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses. But here is a glimpse at grassroots level of changes that were no less significant in the national story. By the 1440s, the people of Kibworth, like many villages throughout England, are on the way to becoming modern people. So that's the story of how the medieval villagers of Kibworth survived famine, pestilence, and the Black Death. Roman rabble. 11,000 and dirty deeper. That's how the villagers got through England's age of disaster and in the end came out stronger. Yummy mummies. 600 years ago, Kibworth was already a deep-rooted community. The old families, the Polis, the Astins, the Swans, had already lived and worked here for centuries. But this story is also about a living English community today. We've been raising funds for six months, and a tough six months, there's been a recession. Because history is not just something that happened back then, in the past. History, in the end, is now, and us. Really for life, Kibworth, 2010, Rose. 65,737 pounds! And it continues. In the next chapter in the story of England, battle for conscience, the rise of the English home, and the new world of Tudor England.